Come on in, have a seat. Bring your donuts up here. Okay. No? Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you are among us here. Um, we are especially grateful, Father, for the opportunity to come and, and sit together and to explore uh, some of the things that you've asked us to do and how we should do those. For us to emulate Christ is a bigger a bigger endeavor, Father, than we ever thought. Um, he, it, was, uh, it was quite an example uh, that he set. And for us to uh, be told by him before he left that we might do greater things uh, is boggling our minds sometimes. And so as we search what that might look like and we try to find ways to, to actually get the courage to do that, we ask that you would be with us, not just in this class, but as we take these things and we ponder them and we put them in our hearts and we watch them express themselves in our daily lives. We thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice. And in his name we pray, amen. Okay, you ready? Yep. Thanks for being here with us again today. Um, it may... Are you finding it odd that in a class about love, we've yet to talk about how to love? <laughs> Is that, has anybody actually caught that, that we have yet to talk about the what to do portion of love? You know, one thing we talked about last week was, okay, if, if, if relationships were, were important enough to God to, for him to describe what they're supposed to be like in the word of God, for him to come to us and say, this is what they should look like. How important is it to Satan that they fail? One of the things I've heard Steve say is that, is that your effectiveness in the kingdom is balanced by the amount that you've been attacked. That's a paraphrase. But balanced by the amount of things that Satan and his forces would be throwing at you to keep you from doing those things that God would have you be doing. Have you ever thought about it that way? Have you ever thought about that there's a purpose for you. That God has outlined for you. And there's people, there's forces trying to keep you from accomplishing that. When you think about it that way, does it start to make a little bit more sense why you might be running into some problems? When you try to do the right thing, when you're trying to be what you're supposed to be, that you might be running into problems because somebody who is far more powerful than you or I, is trying to keep you from doing it. How many of you said to yourself, no good deed goes unpunished? <laughs> Have you had that happen to you? Yeah, me too. So we're talking about relationships in this class. And we're going to kind of be bouncing back and forth between church and individual relationships because, to me, I find it indistinguishable. Church is made up of individual relationships. Indiv individual relationship with God individual relationship between you and me. There is no just kind of community that all seems to work together. We don't all sit in here and sort of look in the same direction and develop relationships with each other. It is about how I interact with you. We're going to talk about one another later. Now, I don't, I don't know if you remember the lesson I gave many months ago, but it's about one another. And how many times in the New Testament talks about one another how we're supposed to interact one with, with each other. Now, if God set up relationship, do you think he might have had a purpose for it? Do you think he was trying to accomplish something by setting up relationship? Of course. He usually has a plan, odd. But he usually has a plan for stuff. So he sets up relationship, and he wants us to learn something from it. How much do you think we could learn about our relationship with God from a relationship with each other? How much do you think we could learn about a relationship with God if we actually started trying to love others the way we've been loved? How much more empathy, maybe, I don't know if that's the right word, so stick with me, would we have for what Jesus 
felt about us, feels about us, if we start trying to love others the way he loves us? Do you think we might get a bit of a better understanding about the lengths that he's gone to for us if we start thinking about the lengths we have to go to to get along with each other? Now, I told you a couple of weeks ago, I have a very, very personal application of, the, of this stuff. And I'm here to tell you that learning how to change you before learning to change other people's, other people's, other people, is something that can change your life and your relationship with God. Are you interested in that? Nah, they don't care. They don't care. No. <laughs> okay. So Either that or they're it? really scared. What they're, 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 hopefully they're scared. I think they're scared. scared. Yeah. yeah, I do too. So one of the things that, the reason why we're talking of so much about what might be wrong is that we have to change the way we're thinking. If we do things the, all, the way we've always done it, what's the result we're going to get? The same. How many of us are just great at relationships? So we might need to change something, <laughs> right? Maybe we need to have a different approach. Maybe we need to back up and understand what is impacting our relationships and making things change. I'm going to read something to you. As soon as I can find it. Steve, do you have anything to say why, find what I lost? Here's the deal. We made, we made an attempt, if you will, while he's looking for that, <laughs> we made an attempt <clears throat> to get you in touch with some promises. He's really talking about something that is about a promise, okay? We can actually promise you some things if you'll cooperate, if you're not too afraid. Um, and one of us was talking to the other one not long ago about what we're really afraid of. And we found out it was not so much what we actually thought. When we got real honest about it, really, really honest, here's what we were really afraid of. We were really more afraid of how powerful we might be in the kingdom if we were to do this well than how weak we are and inept. Does that make sense to you? And, and I illustrated it by taking her hand and asking her, how would you respond if God came here and took you by the hand and said, come on, let's go. I, got to, I want to show you some things. Would that frighten you? That scares me to death. I'm not kidding you. Uh, the idea, do you understand, that if you make a few changes and all of a sudden you actually become more powerful in the kingdom than you ever thought you could possibly and do things and say things that you never have been able to do before. Um, even things like, uh, we, you know, no freedom and happiness. <laughs> God does want you to be happy, but he wants you to be happy in him. Do you understand? Not a worldly kind of happiness. And, 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 and we will not regret the past nor wish to slam the door on it. It will have no hold on you anymore. Are we talking about liberation here now? A, a liberating kind of an event in your life that allows you to be even more useful in the kingdom Maybe a little boldness might even come out of that. Did you find it? I did. Oh, I'm shut up now. <laughs> I thought it was good. I was with you. <laughs> okay. Huh. This says change requires that we identify our destructive patterns of thinking. The next statement in Romans chapter 12, verse 2 is, do not be conformed to this world. A more accurate translation is stop being conformed to this world. The idea isn't to keep from doing something that could potentially happen, but to stop something that is already happening. The conforming is already happening. We are called to stop the process. We live in this fallen world under constant pressure to be squeezed into its mold. We are being pressured into its worldly and destructive ways of thinking about ourselves, others, and God. For change to happen, those destructive patterns must be identified and changed. Once you understand the character of the enemy that rules over this world system, then you can begin to understand how he intends to accomplish his purpose. First of all, Jesus tells us in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus came so that people may have life and have it abundantly. The enemy's strategy is to kill, 
steal, and destroy. Jesus' strategy is to give us abundant life. Jesus also informs us that the enemy at his core is a liar. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says of Satan, Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. If his nature is that of a liar, and if he is the father of lies, then it stands to reason that he will do his work of stealing, killing, and destroying us by the use of lies. Satan destroys our lives by convincing us to believe lies about ourselves, others, God, and life. Now, I want to make this practical. I want to make the practical application. We are all born into this world system, and we are raised in this world system of which Satan is God, lowercase g. We are all under constant pressure from this world to live according to the enemy's lies that are meant to destroy. Everything around us in this world seeks to conform us into believing and thus living according to his lies. Emotionally damaging and hurtful experiences in life are one way that those lies are planted in our hearts. Over time, those lies been, begin to inform everything about how we think about ourselves, others, and God. This is why a very important step in the process of emotional healing and maturity is to identify what those lies are. What experiences in life planted them in us and how those lies are currently having negative and damaging effects on our lives. Who's, li who's, the, who's the biggest liar? Satan. Satan. Why? Huh? He has an agenda. He has a reason. He has something in his mind to do. How? What is it that's powering him up that way? Huh? His core? You got that right. What is at the core of his evil? Say it again. Pride, ego. Pride, ego. Well, yeah, it's obvious in his behavior, right? And what we read about him. But where is the origin of it? His resentment. He has a resentment. Does he not? Who for? God. Okay. And he's going to what? Steal, kill, and destroy, right? Do you think of that as some kind of Armageddon sort of event going to take place someday down the road? Do you see that that way? Well, if he knows the power of resentment, why would he not pass that on to those he wants to harm? Why would he not use that? He knows an awful lot about it, does he not? He's, well, what would you call it, versed in its application and how it makes you um, different, how it changes you? Did he start out with the resentment? I see some of the things that describe him as being totally different from that in his beginning. And his purpose was different. And now it's not. So how would resentment do you in? <coughs> huh? From the inside, right? This is going to be an inside job, this killing and destroying and stealing. Not an outside job. Did you ever think about that? It, some of you are going to go on like this. Yeah, it's going to be an inside job. The nature of a resentment is to re-feel something. That's what the word means. R-E in front of any word means to do again, right? Put R-E in front of paint. Paint again. To re-feel means that all he has to do is get you offended one time by someone that you never thought it would come from, ever, and how many times would you relive that event before you actually settled it and got rid of it? The crazy part about that is this, is that your physical human body, do you understand, doesn't know the difference in the first time you actually had someone offend you and a resentment developed and the thousandth time you recall it. Your body responds exactly the same way. Higher heart rate, acid dumping into your stomach, adrenaline, all those other kinds of things, okay? So, 
How many resentments do you have? See? Cumulative anxieties in that form cause people to have to medicate. Do you get the idea? How many of you medicate with chocolate cake? Come on. Hope. See, there's a hand. Look at, there's some honest people in here. Thank you so many. How many? Yes, yes. Okay. Does it make you feel different? Yes, for a moment it just does, you know. And there it lies. The nature of addiction is we hate our reality at any given time and we want to do whatever it takes to make us feel different. That's what it is. Okay. Did Paul have a problem with one? Yes. Somebody dropped something. Shock, maybe. Paul had an addiction. He said, why do I do what I know I shouldn't be doing, but I do it anyway? Does that sound like a definition of uncontrollable behavior and wondering why I'm not able to do something about that? Yeah. What was he looking for? Probably the same thing anybody looks for in chocolate cake. Just a moment, you understand, an interlude, if you will, of medication or soothing things that the world has to offer. So if Satan produces an incident in your life, you understand, where a resentment is living now in you, how many worldly ways would he know you would choose on your own to medicate that? How about work? Any workaholics in here? Come on, be real. Is work a better place for you to be than your home? Sometimes it is, isn't it? You get more pats on the back. The paycheck makes you feel better than your family does. Things like that can happen. The escaping, you understand, to an oasis in life can often be really simple things like that that don't appear to be addictive in nature, but they're medicating, and you never thought there was anything wrong with medicating with work because everyone pats you on the back for all that. Little do you know in the process, you've created an idolatrous relationship with work. Jesus Christ came here to help us face reality, not run from it. Satan knows the way you're going to run from it is going to be a worldly attachment of some sort that you become aware of, but not fear it or see the danger in it. Anybody here want to be playing golf right now? Come on. <laughs> See, the, <laughs> come on. See, her dad is also going like this. <laughs> yeah, he taught her how to, you know, okay. Doctors have been recommending relieving stress to human beings with golf forever. Have they not? Okay. So medicating, do you understand, our irritations, our inflammations is how God is going to maybe talk to us differently sometimes, maybe ask us to do something different about that, maybe Him? Is He the best medication that there is on the planet? And how did He produce that for us? What did He give us that is the best medication we'll ever, ever, ever need? Eternal life. He does not guarantee us a safe place here. He gave, he, he gave us clearly through His Son a safe place in the next life, not here. We can endure anything here if we are certain of that. You know, the Bible talks about being called to be different. We just read that, uh, the, that scripture earlier. So we're called to be different. I don't think that's a concept that we dig into enough in terms of what's different. Um, and I think sometimes we oversimplify it. We, we say, okay, we're called to be different, and we start to define those by the things that we do and we don't do. I'm different because I choose not to drink alcohol. I'm different because I choose not to steal. 
we define ourselves, we say being called to be different is these things that I do and I don't do, okay? What do you think people would see? Where would they see a difference in us? Do they see it in what we choose to do and not do, or do they see it in how we interact with them? Where do they see us? Not our list of do's and don'ts. They see us and how we connect with them. That's relationship. That's what we're talking about. So if we're called to be different, maybe we need to start thinking about that in terms of how we are perceived, how people are seeing us. So that's why we've been talking about all this stuff that we're bringing into a relationship. Because if I bring in resentments into a relationship with anyone, if I bring resentments into that, then I am coming in with a loaded shotgun <laughs> and, and somebody's going to get hurt. I think they say there's an old saying about that. If you hang a gun over the mantle in the first act, you have to use it by the third. <laughs> How many times have you gone into a relationship either saying, this time it's going to be different. This time it's going to be great. Or you go into it with the anticipation of everything that's going to go wrong. How many of us actually deal with one another either looking for that thing that's going to be perfect looking for that thing that's going to be okay this time this person is the person that i'm going to be able to deal with the way, the right way or we go in and say what are you going to do to me you're going to hurt me at some point what's it going to be and that's really what steve is talking about we end up carrying these resentments around and and and, and we carry them in and we actually they end up damaging things before we even get there they damage things as soon as we step into it because we're carrying them with us. It's not what the other person is bringing to the table. It's what we are bringing to the table. So if we are supposed to be seen as different, how, how differently do you think people would react to us if we start showing those things that are descriptive of the way Jesus walked? One of the things we're going to talk a lot about is critical spirit. Having a critical spirit. Do you know what I mean when I say having a critical spirit? Have you ever wondered they're why? They're being critical right now, yeah, dude. Did you notice that? See that? Have, have you ever wondered why so many of the Gospels are dedicated, so much of the Gospels is dedicated to talking about the Pharisees? There is an immense amount of the description of Jesus' life talking about the Pharisees. Have you ever wondered why? Are you wondering why now? <laughs> Good. Thank you for stealing my point. Yes. No, that's no. It's exactly that's exactly what, what I was no, getting. No, dude, she I'm got saying. your point. She got my point. Yes. Right. Before I even said it, she got it. <laughs> no, that, no, you're no. I'm kidding. You're exactly right. Favorite um, <laughs> Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Not bad. All right. How many times do we? How many times are we? Do we catch ourselves being afraid of humans? What kind of situations might be just kind of superficial, do you understand? And almost in an everyday sort of way, but you change direction, change something, do you understand? Because the fear of a human being has come into your realm. Can you give me some examples of what that might look like? <laughs> Not getting on an elevator. Not getting on an elevator, okay. Um, any, anybody ever been in a stairwell with somebody that you didn't want to be in the stairwell with? You know how, like, isolated stairwells are? Anybody not pick somebody up on the side of the road that's in trouble anymore? Uh, that kind of thing. 
Um, and, and, you know, you could actually uh, be discriminating that way because of an ultra-sensitivity that we have. Yes? Mm -hmm. I've heard somebody say that we're really more afraid of them saying yes than no, because if they say yes, then the next place that we're going to go to is very frightening to us, and that's what this makes me think of, because then we're yep. going to be with that person and have to go through all these things and have this relationship and teaching, and then that's pretty scary. So is there still a pharisaical problem with us as Christians who put a burden on man instead of setting them free. Do you understand what I mean by that? Because what you're doing here is you are succumbing to a... You know, there's lots of different kinds of fear, okay? Anticipatory fear is one of the most powerful fears that human beings are subjected to. And, and the reason is is because it's in our imagination. Well, it's a fear we have yet to actually encounter yet, we have conjured it, do you understand? And so we avoid it simply because that's what the whole process is for, is a protective mechanism. Anticipatory fear, do you understand, is also related to our past in that we may have had something happen to us in our past that was difficult. And we will avoid all kinds of things, do you understand? We're now crippled, do you understand? We're now approaching life dragging one leg. All right? We're not free, do you understand, to uh, participate uh, in a level of conversation with other people without dragging this thing along with us like a ball and chain. And so if we were to simply try to um, do what Christ was probably better at doing than anyone on the planet, and that is this, if we were to simply um, trust God and live in the moment, how many of you are having something bad happen to you right now? What is it? What'd she say? No, I mean in my life. No, right now. Like where you are right now. Is this? Yeah. Yeah. You understand? We we sometimes, do you understand, can't enjoy the peace of the moment that we're actually in before fear, do you understand, of thinking and worrying about something that hasn't even happened yet, but because we've seen it happen before, either in ourselves or other people, we're waiting on the other shoe to drop, you know? And we're crippled with that. Do you suppose Satan knows that works on us? The they sell alarm systems that way. I, do you have an alarm system in your house? No. I don't have a dog. That's, That's probably not a good thing to put out in public. Yeah. This is on the internet. <laughs> I, have a, I have a big dog. Uh, he has a real... <laughs> Do you understand that's how they sell alarm systems is come to your door and tell you who's been robbed in the neighborhood recently? How slick is that? Let me inject a little fear in your life right quick so I can sell you something. Okay. Are you being robbed? Of course you are in your mind. It's, it's happening. It's happening. You're going to go sit in a closet with a shotgun now. That's how we are. Okay. This kind of fear that she brought up about, I'm afraid they might say yes. What do we fear the most about sharing Christ with other people? Them refusing or them accepting? She says accepting. Both. Do you think both? I think we can probably, in an anticipatory fear sort of way, draw on either one of them if we need to, right? To protect ourselves, okay? Y'all know, know Joe Martinez, don't you? Most of you? You know, he's a pretty good guy <laughs> most of the time. And, and you know what he does? He's a remodeler. You know, he does remodeling and stuff like that. And he's pretty good at that too. You know what he's really good at? He's really good at hiring people that came through James Group Ministries and having them steal $20,000 worth of his tools so far. That's what he's really good at. And you know why I say he's good at it? He just goes and buys some more with a job that God gave him to cover the cost. 
I wish he was here today. He's in Lancaster at another James Group thing right now. But he, he would stand up here and tell you how many times he has been ripped off. I was, um, um, by all means, in a, in a situation where um, discipling took place according to the Lowry system of discipling, okay? Sometimes that's fun and sometimes it's not. Okay, but I remember this vividly. How many times those people had drunk sleeping in the same room with their kids, you know, and they're sobering up in there. And they're, you know, they'd get up in the middle of the night and steal everything and leave. And the kids would wake Charles and Carolyn up and say, I think somebody just stole something out of your purse at 2 o'clock in the morning. Do you know that never stopped them from doing the work? They were really good at doing the work. You know why they were good? The fear never overcame them. It, it, they'll tell you stories about God making that up all along the way. And there is that passage in the Bible where Jesus is trying to get these guys to understand, here's what we're going to do, something entirely different than anything you've ever done before. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to tell you, first of all, throw down all that stuff, all those nets, leave that boat there. Don't bring anything extra Will you just come with me. You know as well as I do that somebody with a boat and nets and, and being in the fish business was the equivalent to owning an Albertsons back then. They were not poor people. Do you understand that? They were business people. He's saying, we're not going to do this the same way as you've been doing it. He says, we're going to be cared for in such a way as to be able to freely give and freely receive. In other words, they weren't going to own anything. God gave it to them. God will replace it if somebody steals it. He'll give them everything they need. We're going to teach you how to live in the moment and stop worrying about things. Worrying is the illusion that you're in control of something when in actuality you're not. Are we predisposed to that? Do you think Satan knows that about us? And one of the things that, <clears throat> if Satan's lying to us, might he be taking something that is good and changing it in our mind? One of the reasons that I brought up the Pharisees earlier is because um, if you've ever studied why the Pharisees came about, it's for a very good reason. I don't know if you knew that, but... Okay, the Greeks took over the world, right? And what's the Greeks' philosophy of religion? You kind of do your own thing, right? It's all about just developing. It's a whole different sort of philosophical approach. And, and, and the, the, there were Jews that had embraced that sort of like, okay, the, these things don't really matter. It's not really, you know, they had, they had kind of said, we're going to forget all the laws that Jesus made, or the, sorry, that God had laid out for him. They said, we're going we're gonna to forget all that. The Pharisees said, no, we cannot forget the law. The law is important. God gave it to us, so let's protect the law. Let's make sure that the law is clear and followed. It starts out as a good idea, right? What did they do? They added to it, okay? In order to protect it, they started kind of pushing out the boundaries and making it bigger and making it more and more. And then it became only about the law and not about the relationship that the law was supposed to bring. It became about the law itself. And so Satan took a thing that was great and he obscured people's point of view. He lied to them so that they changed it and they turned it into something bad. So in the New Testament, it talks about Jesus having compassion on people because they're harassed. This is the way it describes it. They are harassed. Who was harassing them? Religion was harassing them because it had become bigger than what it was supposed to be. And so this sort of whole culture had developed of you better not mess up. You better not mess up because we're watching. And when you have religion and government mixed together, it starts to get complicated, doesn't it? 
you better not mess up or there are, there are consequences. Those are the two things you're not supposed to ever talk about together. Religion and uh, government? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think Satan is going to use either one of them? Or both? Yeah. Can it, how easily confused are you? Crystal's saying pretty easy. Huh? Yeah. Well, so you got it in the right order. You do. The, the very idea that you have to be sufficiently confused before you can be lied to is, do you think he knows that about us? Yeah. Are you, how many of you are confused about your role in the kingdom? What you're supposed to be doing? Or what you can do, could do, should do, ought to do, would have done? How many of you are not really sure? How many of you think you know? Some, some of you went like that. <laughs> that was slick, boy, I'm telling you. You participating though, right? Yeah, I love it. How many of you really are confused just a little bit about what you ought to be doing? I think you're confused or you wouldn't be in here. <laughs> really? Do, do you think in, in our... He's, he's, he's um, biblically underpinned, do you understand, in ways that I can only dream about. Um, and, 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 and he was able to pay dollars and cents for his school. I went to another school where dollars and cents won't work. Okay, uh, pounds of flesh is what it cost. <laughs> and so uh, he and I are trying to blend those, you understand? It's what we're doing up here. Uh, we're trying to make what the, what the stomping the world can give you and what the Bible says to go together. Do you think God knew we were going to be confused? The, the, does he think he knows what Satan's trying to do here? Uh, is he still going to leave us choice, however? He's not taking that away, is he? He's not, is he? So, so consequently, is truth an absolute essential here? Okay, truth is not created, it's discovered, right? I discovered truth one way, he discovered truth a completely different way. Okay, are they both truth? Yeah. See, I'm teaching him how to discover some truth my way, and he's teaching me how to discover some truth his way, and we're blending all that, do you understand, in a way that makes us both more useful in the kingdom. But you see, he and I had to start with a relationship first. And you know how that started? You want to tell him how it started? No, let me tell him. I'll tell him. <laughs> I asked him to breakfast and told him all my problems. I just told him everything I struggle with. I did. And he was, I don't know, I don't know if you ever finished that meal, did you? I don't think so. It was like. Because <laughs> I do everything I can not to look like that's going on. You know what I'm saying? O okay. But you know what it gave him? It gave him an opportunity and a feeling of... Uh, security and safety to be able to talk to me about his and so we share that way okay um and we are uh, at we are um praying all the time uh, while we're doing this to let the spirit work within us uh, not just be a couple of guys that stand up here looking like we're waiting on a bus you know <laughs> for it to have some meaning and that's what i want to ask you about right now is are you struggling to place meaning in your life? Are you placing meaning in all the wrong places? You get that? We can make meaning out of something that really doesn't have any. And we can steal meaning from something that should have meaning and put it in places where it doesn't belong. We as human beings have what's called a landscape of meaning. And I'm not talking about shrubs and trees. <laughs> I'm talking about if you were to stand up on a nice high place and look down at your life and look at everything in it 
and you start over here with your family and your job and your house and your dog and your cat and you just keep going with the, with the church and Christ and, and, and your car and your bicycle and you just have this landscape of life, do you understand, that you're living right now and you look at it and you start to place meaning on each and everything you see. You only have a certain amount of meaning, however. It's not an endless supply. Do you understand? You're going to have, let's, for conversation's sake, just say five gallons of meaning. Kind of like paint, you know. And you're going to place enough meaning, do you understand, on things to really have gone clearly out of meaning. Your bucket's empty. And maybe there are some things in your life that have too much meaning or they're in the wrong places. If Satan can help you place all your meaning in all the wrong places, you're at risk of being useless in the kingdom. Who knows better where your meaning is than you? Hmm? I can't hear you. My hearing aids are turned off. <laughs> If you can't do that, if you, if you don't know how to look in this direction, this way, and discover where all your meaning is and be honest with yourself to the degree that you're able to discern where it's in the wrong places and how to put it in the right places, then you may need some help with that. Well, I think the smartest thing Satan ever did is not appear. Do you understand? We really don't know what he looks like at all. Even if we were to look at how beautiful he was, we don't even know what that looks like. He is incognito because it's brilliant. If he can make himself look like a cartoon, he'd love to. Because the seriousness of what he does is about spiritual death, is it not? Yeah. So if we saw him coming, what would we do? If we actually knew what he looked like, saw him coming, what would you do? So why would he reveal himself? Did you see? Well, the last time I saw him, he had on designer jeans and was driving a Cadillac. Oh, my. Oh, my. And did you think you could fix him? <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> okay, so, so we're hoping, here's what we're hoping, and, and we're out of time almost, but here's what we're hoping. We're hoping that we can help you place the meaning where it belongs, which will do all kinds of things. We can promise you that you will know peace if you do that well. Uh, Steve, would you define meaning? Sure. Uh, having weight, okay, importance, right, or influence. It influences you. Does that make sense? It becomes important and is an influence on you. Got that? Okay, you've heard the story of the man who has a son and his friend and they are in a boat wreck and, one, and his son is a Christian and he knows that the boy that he brought with as a guest is not a Christian and he lets his son drown and saves the one that wasn't saved yet. Where was all of his meaning? It was in, it went this way, didn't it? Remember I told you about PMS? What is, what is your purpose, your motivation, and your strategy for doing anything here on the planet should be this direction. You want to do a meaning check on something that you're doing? Check this way. Do you understand? Anybody in here can't remember PMS? That's why I did that, okay? Because I need to remember that every day. 
Anything else, Dave? One of the things that we're going to do is we're going to start looking at what, how love is described. And instead of just talking about what it is, we're going to talk, we're going to try to talk about what might keep us from doing that. So we're going to try to balance it with, okay, this is what we're supposed to be. Why is that hard? So we're going to talk about the other part of it. One of the books that um, I've read that's been very impactful is called The Love Dare. Now this is specifically t uh, pointed at um, uh, married couples. Um, the concepts here are applicable to any relationship. So if you haven't, if you don't have a copy of this, I re would recommend that you get this because we're going to talk some about this. What it talks about is applying these principles. Okay, so what I don't want to happen is that we sit in here and we all nod and we go, yeah, those are neat ideas. Remember what I said in the very first class. I'm going to ask you to pick a relationship to work on. And I'm, I'm going to say don't pick the one that's already working well. Pick one that needs work. Pick one that isn't working well. And we're going to take some of these principles and we're going to, I want you to take them home and say, how do I actually apply this to this relationship that might be difficult? Thank you. Have a good day.